Thank you, Mike, for that, um, that very uh, complimentary <laughs> introduction. Um, so what all, all I wanted to do at the beginning here before we get into our speakers was maybe set the stage uh, for um, what we're aiming towards uh, with this workshop. Um, and then, so just to give you some, some context um, about multiple sclerosis for those of you who, who don't work in this field at, the at this time. Um, so MS is a disease of the central nervous system um, that's characterized by inflammation and neural external degeneration, both gray and white matter. So it's affecting almost 3 million people worldwide. And uh, some of the symptoms that are uh, associated with it include cognitive impairment, vision loss, weakness in limbs, dizziness, and fatigue. Um, and, uh, and there is no cure currently for, for MS. There are some, some, some therape therapeutics to uh, help uh, decrease uh, symptoms and slow progression, but there is no cure. Um, and one of the most, uh, uh, one of the important diagnosis criteria for MS is the, is the presence of lesions visible within the CNS on, on MRI. So I'm actually showing you some, um, some images in the bottom here. It's actually a loop of, of longitudinal uh, MRI scans of the brain. Um, and so what you can see are um, the, these uh, T2, T2 lesions, we usually call them T2, T2 lesions in the white matter um, that are, are visible on the flare images. You can see them also on these T2 weighted images and uh, proton density weighted images. You can also see them on uh, um, uh, and the same locations on the T1 weighted MP rage images as well. Um, and, so, uh, and so another thing that you see in these patients is also atrophy occurring. So you can also notice that some of the, some of the structures are changing in size. And so these are, this is common in, in disease progression in MS that these lesions tend to start growing. Um, and, um, and you also see an uh, increase in atrophy. So, uh, so clearly this, this, this ability to visualize uh, these pathological processes in the brain um, has pointed to the use of quantification of, of either lesion counts or lesion volume uh, for clinical trials and, and many research studies. So, uh, so there's a lot of interest, of course, uh, in that case, in trying to automate the process of quantifying the lesions. Um, and so, as you can tell from these images, this is pretty similar to many other segmentation problems that we acquire, uh, we, we encounter in. Um, in medical imaging, um, you know, lesion segmentation seems like a, a, a problem that's sort of well suited for, for the latest machine learning and deep learning algorithms that are available. Uh, of course, there are some challenges, some hurdles that are um, that need to be uh, surmounted to to develop algorithms, um, and one of the main ones is the the availability of training data. Um, and so, in, in this figure here, I'm showing you. Um, delineations of, of, of the, the T2 lesions uh, from two different human raters. Um, and as you can imagine, this is like a, this is a slow, tedious process. It's, it's not very fun. It's much more fun to, to sort of develop and, and run a machine learning algorithm than it is to sort of manually go through uh, these images and label, label the, the, the pixels uh, representing lesions. Um, so, because of this, uh, because it's so laborious, getting training data is pretty hard to come by. Um, it's worth noting that there's been um, several uh, challenges, uh, grand challenges that have been uh, uh, run over the past uh, decade or so um, that has released training data, data for tr training and evaluation of algorithms. Um, so there's, um, there's, there's at least four. Um, that I'm noting here. Um, and, uh, and so these challenges have provided data on the order of, of tens of data sets. So, so I think the first one was around 20 to 30 data sets, you know, um, and then the later ones were pro pro uh, providing a few more, um, but it's really sort of uh, still uh, left fewer than 100. So not nearly on the scale of data sets that you might encounter in some of the computer vision challenges where they have thousands of data sets um, for training purposes. Um, so despite the challenges, uh, these, these, these organized challenges and the many publications that have come out uh, for uh, 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 describing algorithms for lesion segmentation, MS lesion segmentation, there are, are still no sort of well-established algorithms that are used throughout the community. So what happens is that there are, there are algorithms that are developed for group by, by certain groups and they work well on the data from that group or, or in particular data sets, but 
they don't really make it out of the, the silo of a, a particular institution. And part of the reason is because there's such heterogeneity in, in the acquisition data. So what I'm showing you here are, are longitudinal T1-weighted images of an MS patient that was uh, scanned at NIH. And these scans are about five years apart, but it's just really there here to just show you an example of you know, how much variation there can be in the contrast and noise properties of the MRI. Um, so, you know, there are different types of scanners, 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, different scanner manufacturers, and all of these uh, variations uh, in manufacturer as well as the, the pulse sequences result in uh, notable changes in the contrast. And so, uh, as, as many of you probably well know, when you, when you have a, a segmentation deep network, and you have these training pairs, um, if you feed it something that's within your, your, your training data, you get a very, very reasonable result, uh, oftentimes, as long as, as long as your algorithm is well designed. Um, but if you, if you feed it something that's outside of your training data, then you get a result that's not accurate at all. So you get um, this problem of, of, of the algorithm not generalizing to data outside of your training distribution. Um, so just to, to give you a side by side, this is what the segmentation should look like for this image. Um, and, and this is what you get when the, because the training data, uh, because the, the, the test data is not, it's outside the training distribution. So what is, what is uh, one approach for trying to address this problem? Um, and and is, that is to try to get a richer data, data set. And as we all know, it's, it's, it's difficult uh, to, to get training data across diff different institutions since every institution is gonna have different protocols, different types of data, uh, different populations uh, with that they are uh, different types of populations of patients that they're scanning. Um, it would really be ideal to try to pool all of that different data together. Um, so federated, federated learning is one way to, to address the, the problem of not having to directly share all of those images. Um, so instead of sharing the data, the model, the machine learning model is shared between the sites while the data uh, remains siloed. Okay, so it's, this is just an illustration here of two different sites. Of course, we can, we can increase this to, to any number of sites. Um, um, so, but, the, but the main idea is that since we now have pulled this much larger data set, uh, the data set across institutions, we now have access to much larger, more diverse data sets that will um, allow our machine learning model to, to generalize much better. So that's, so all of this is just trying to set the stage for what we'll be uh, discussing and, and hearing talks about today. Um, what is needed to, um, to sort of push forward this idea that we might want to uh, form a consortium for federal learning within, uh, to perform MS lesion segmentation. So, so what are the, some of the things that, um, we'll be hearing about from the various speakers and in our discussions, um, what we're, we're hoping to hear about is, um, you know, how do we uh, get institutions together who are willing to, I'm sorry, to work uh, together to, uh, to build these, uh, to build these uh, federated learning uh, algorithms? Um, how do we develop consistent data handling protocols and formats? Uh, how do we decide on what software platform we should be using for data transfer and, and processing? Um, you know, selection of segmentation algorithm, uh, aggregation algorithms, security, privacy uh, considerations. These are all kinds of, of questions that hopefully we can have uh, some discussion about uh, during the, the, the workshop today. Uh, and finally, you know, of course, if we're doing a lot of work to get this together, are there, are there grant funding opportunities out there um, which could help us uh, uh, do some of the work uh, and pay for some of the work. Um, so that's all I had uh, for this initial uh, talk. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to Julia.